here in EDL Lab and the coordinator for Ed Psych and Biomedical Science. Um, so today's talk is sponsored by BEST, which is the Virginia Education Science Training Program. We've been at this since 2004. Um, it's been supported by IES and the U.S. Department of Ed, and BEST is preparing students to apply theory and methods from social sciences to research in schools and classrooms. Um, the program faculty and students strive to improve equity and evidence in education. So today we're really delighted <laughs> I'm particularly delighted to welcome Dr. Kirby. Um, it, um, I'll tell you a little bit about um, Tim Kirby, who I've known for many years now. Um, and so um, Tim is currently an associate professor at George Mason University. Um, he is actually the coordinator of their Ed Psychology program. Um, and Tim conducts research on early childhood classroom experiences and has spent the last three years working very intensely on a measure of social emotional learning qualities of the classroom. And I think that's going to be the focus of your talk today, which I'm very excited to hear about. So if you look at Tim's work, there are a few themes that are really evident in his work. So he uses advanced statistical models to understand the patterns that occur in classrooms. So he has some research examining what happens in the beginning of the year and how that relates to what happens later in the year. He has other research that looks at the role of consistency in the teacher. So how important is it that the teacher is consistent over time as opposed to being highly variable and how those interactions relate to children's outcomes. Um, so Tim's work focuses on core issues related to early childhood preschool education and early childhood. Um, although broadly some might say that he studies social and emotional learning, a lot of the work he's doing right now really focuses on emotion regulation and emotion awareness of, of students. Um, Tim's also been engaged with the APA Center for Psychology in Schools and Education. Um, and it's, um, APA has a very wide distribution, so we do work with APA, it makes it up to a lot of people. And he's currently working on a survey of teachers um, that you may want to ask him about at some point during this visit. So I have this wonderful professional um, connection to Tim that I'd like to tell you a little bit about. Um, one of the things that strikes me is that much of our work has many challenges, like we, we do a lot of struggling day to day, and once in a while you have a full circle moment where you get to really um, experience the joy that comes with the work that we do. And at this moment we have um, Tim here, who was my former student, and also the former student of her Richards, who was also here, who is a retired faculty member in EdPsych, and was actually the program coordinator of EdPsych for, get this, 30 years. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's still a lot. <laughs> and so it's really exciting to have Tim here in the presence of two of his mentors, and I'm just honored that or her has decided to join us as well for this. Um, so I want to mention that Tim went to college at University of Michigan and graduated as a biology major in 1997. And then shortly afterwards, um, Tim took a job at a manufacturing plant. There's a place in Michigan where they were painting Lincoln Navigators and Ford Expeditions. And Tim was overseeing the machine, the system that recaptured the paint that didn't hit the car. And in fact, did you know that about three quarters of the paint directed the car actually hits the car, which means a quarter of the paint doesn't. <laughs> so I think this might have been very good preparation for manuscript submission. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I actually anticipate that your hit rate is probably higher than your hit rate does with the paint in the car. I'll do have to recapture it though and put it back on. Exactly. <laughs> because it's very important. But I'm struck by this um, thing that um, Tim told me about that is if that if the system yeah. stopped working for one minute it cost the company ten thousand dollars and Tim did not like this work um, 
and um, was working, um, then became um, doing Christian fellowship work at a private school. And they turned to him and they said, would you like to te teach high school biology? And he said, sure. Yes. Now this is an important thing because one of the characteristics of Tim is that he often says, sure. <laughs> and it leads to all kinds of interesting things. So um, shortly after that, he, um, that, that got him very interested in teaching. He went back to Michigan to get a master's in teaching. And then around 2004 or so, Tim made his way here in Curry and um, to study adolescent development. Um, Tim learned to teach from Herb Richards um, and began re research with Herb as well. And then I remember meeting Tim and we had a conversation and he was, um, I was just really impressed with his ideas and he said, yeah, I'd be so interested in working with you. Do you have anything going on um, related to adolescence? And I turned to him and I said, well, how about early childhood? And he said, sure. <laughs> and so that began um, uh, uh, some really um, exciting and interesting work that we um, did together um, during his graduate school time. Um, and so, um, so then from that, he moved into the early childhood field. He's conducted work on classroom and children's development of self-regulation. He started applying his longitudinal methods to studying classrooms. He graduated in 2008, went right to his assistant professor position at George Mason, where he's been there since then. They are darn lucky to have you. Um, and I'm just a very proud mentor at this moment. So I'm pleased to welcome Tim Kirby, and he will be talking about observing the teaching of emotions in classrooms. Thank you. It is a joy to be back. Um, I have been down to Charlottesville since graduating, of course, but I haven't been in this room since uh, approximately 2008, and there were bookshelves where you all are sitting. Um, but I have been in, in your seats, so to speak, because at that time we had Friday morning speakers come, and I would come and listen, and uh, of course, participate in many of the activities that continue on today. So today I am going to be focusing on a current area of research that is getting the bulk of my attention. I do have a lot of other uh, things that I have investigated and to some extent are investigating. The beauty of what I'm presenting today is that it's brand new. I mean, the stuff that I'm presenting today uh, it, basically hasn't really been presented before, certainly not in a, much of a research capacity. The, the challenge for me is that this is stuff that, although I spend my life with my head in this stuff, it's, it's kind of a new uh, presentation for me, so bear with me as we work our way through this. Um, but I want to talk to you about emotion teaching, the teaching of emotions in classroom, particularly in early childhood. So there's a long history of whole child education in early childhood where we look not just at you know, individual facets of the child and how they're doing academically and so on, but really trying to understand the child as a whole. Um, and as a matter of fact, if we look at social emotional <coughs> education, now there, in all 50 states we have preschool learning standards, which is a relatively recent phenomenon. Now this talk is going to drill down more to be focused on emotional competence. So oftentimes we talk about social emotional competence, social emotional learning, SEL, and it kind of all gets lumped together. Um, in my own experience working in this area, oftentimes when we're talking about social emotional learning, really it's kind of like social emotional learning. And what I'm gonna be talking to you about today certainly makes it social emotional learning. Okay, so we're really trying to focus on the emotional aspects of it. Now, when I talk about uh, of emotional learning, I want to just give people a, a sense for where I'm coming from. And so when we talk about emotional competence, what is it? I'm going to adopt the Denim view of emotional competence. Uh, Suzanne Denham also worked at George Mason, uh, recently retired. And so spending time working with her and being around her and reading her work, that, that's some of the model that I'm using here. And so from this vantage point, just to paint a little bit of a, a broad brush uh, about what I'm talking about, 
One aspect is emotion knowledge. And so when we talk about children's emotion knowledge, what we're talking about is their knowledge of their own emotions and other people's emotions, um, antecedents and consequences of emotion. I mean, if you look at a, another face, can you tell what emotion it, that other person is having? And things of that nature. So they can often tell you, you know, this will make this other child angry. Oh, how are they feeling? Um, to some extent, how their parents express their own emotions as well. So those are all skills that would fall under emotion knowledge. Emotion expression is a, another aspect of emotional competence. And so with emotional expression, it's essentially how they express their emotions. Do they express a normal repertoire of emotions, including those basic emotions? Are they are they presenting those emotions that are developing in social situations like guilt and so on? But part of what we want when, with emotional expression when we see a competent child is we want to see a greater preponderance of positive emotion. So it's not that kids don't emote negative emotions, it's just we want to see a lot more positive emotions. Uh, if a kid is very angry all of the time, uh, for example, that's, that's going to feel less competent. And children who express more positive emotions, like ratio-wise, are viewed more positively by teachers, and they tend to act more pro-socially as well. So there is something to the expression of emotions. And then finally, we get to emotion regulation. So this is, if somebody's expressing emotion, there are going to be times where they need to regulate it. And when we to give a little bit more of a technical definition here, we're talking about changing the intensity, duration, or even type of emotion. So are, <coughs> are they able to bring their emotions down a little bit and not have it be so big? Are they able to cut it short a little bit, some sort of display of negative emotion? The last one might seem a little bit strange to you where they're actually changing the type of emotion. This is something that is gonna be more prevalent in adults, but the example that I would give is if you, for example, experience a breakup and you're feeling sad, do you focus on some negative things that make you angry instead? And then all of a sudden you're feeling angry instead of sad. That, that's actually a type of emotion regulation. Broadly speaking though, we're, we're thinking about down-regulating where there's some sort of either very big positive display and we want the child to kind of rein it in, or very big negative display and we want the child to rein it in. But upregulation also happens too, where we're trying to make the child feel, for example, more positive emotion, and we might upregulate that uh, a little bit. So those are the, the skills that I'm talking about in children when I talk about emotional competence. Now, these skills have uh, important downstream characteristics. Um, we see that children without these emotional skills have some less good outcomes in terms of participation. Um, they tend to like school less over time and so on. And we also see that it predicts things like academics even. I don't like to uh, hang my argument on the value of social emotional skills just because it's important for academics because I think that they're important in their own rights. But nonetheless, even if you only care about academics, you should still care about social emotional skills. So, kind of got to do when I think about how emotional competence plays out in the classroom, so we've got these three emotional competence skills that I mentioned, um, and then what the teacher would see uh, for children who are emotionally competent, well, they're going to probably see less negative, uh, sorry, less aggression and negativity, they're going to seem more pro social, and they're going to seem better adjusted. That's kind of in the near term, and then longer term, we tend to see these things like academic readiness and classroom adjustments. So there are a whole host of reasons why these uh, early developing emotional competence skills are important. Now, the critical question that I ask, and what this study is really trying to get at, is what do teachers do to help children to become emotionally competent? So the role of the teacher in facilitating and fostering these skills in, in young children. So to do that, uh, I'm gonna be talking a lot about this 
measure that I've been developing um, with Kate Zinzer and Rachel Gordon at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to create an observational measure of those things that teachers do that promote the emotional competence in children. We call it the emotors, which stands for Emotion Teaching Rating Scale. <laughs> Who knew that an online acronym generator would come with rest of <laughs> So the emotors. Um, so when I when I talk about the emotors, I'm talking about this uh, IES funded Goal Five grant. Thankfully, IES funds some measurement development work. And this is one of those projects. So we're in our third of four years right now. So a lot of this stuff is very freshly uh, developed. Year one, what we did is we went into the literature and we tried to understand emotional competence and these socializing elements of emotional competence. Now, it hopefully doesn't surprise you to learn that a lot of that literature is actually in the parenting and so we went through a lot of parenting literature. Um, we did pull in um, school-based literature as, as much as we could. We looked at, so that research literature, we looked at state policy uh, documents around what children need to know and what teachers need to be doing. We looked at other measures that have been developed and what they might get at uh, in terms of uh, emotional competence teaching. Um, and we, we coded all of that literature. And we tried to develop items that would get at these different things that we were coding. And so we generated, no kidding, something like a thousand items. Just, okay, if this, is, if this is something that a teacher might do, what could we ask, what could we see that would get at that? And so we generated a multitude of items. And um, then we started to, to call it down and, and combine similar items across different sources and so on. Um, until we ended year one with a, with a draft of the instrument, uh, a, a very rough draft, but a sense for these are the items. And then once you have the items, that's like the question. What are the answers that you are going to allow? Like the anchors. And so we generated anchors. Year two involved going into some pilot video data that we had. Um, we had 621 usable segments, uh, 10 minute video segments. And, but all of these video segments were only from nine classrooms in a university based center. And so we knew that we were getting a relatively narrow look of what the type of classrooms that we were getting, uh, using the instrument with, but we also, it gave us a chance to say, are we seeing what we thought we would see? When we try to code with these items, do they work? Are there things that we're missing? And we kept on going back to the drawing board. So this is a very iterative project. We've, it's had some formal iterations, but leading up to it, there were many more where we would revise an item, we would watch a video, we would try it out, and things of that nature. So I am going to be presenting some pilot data later on that's more so psychometrically focused. Um, this year, we are in preschools, and we're trying to capture a lot more video from uh, various other kinds of centers and schools. So uh, across the University of Illinois in Chicago and at George Mason, We've got different centers that we're going out to and we're collecting a lot more video data. Again, to do some of the same type of coding, um, but now with the wider breadth and the types of kids and classrooms that we're seeing. Um, we have finished our fall wave of data collection. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Um, and we've coded from the fall 426 video segments. And later on in this presentation, I'm gonna be able to give you some descriptives based on our fall data that I was literally computing on Wednesday for this presentation. So this is hot off the presses kind of stuff. So that's, that's the project. Um, gives you a sense for where we are, what I can and can't talk about to some extent. Now, the measure is built off of this idea of 
uh, the teaching of emotion skills. So fundamentally, we say that there are three things that a teacher does that helps children learn to be emotionally competent. And again, bear in mind, this is an observational measure. And part of that is with the idea that these interactions can happen throughout the day. This isn't confined to a particular SEL teaching time. Um, so uh, these are things that we think happen throughout the day. Modeling, I'll go through these in, in more detail, but modeling essentially is the teacher's own emotions present in the classroom. Instructing is when the teacher is explicitly saying something to children about emotions. And reacting is, well, the, the kids start with the, by having some sort of emotion. How does the teacher respond? And then relating. Relating is a little bit different. It's the relationships that are evident in the classroom. And we think that the relating is essentially a, mod uh, a moderator where it's either going to amplify or diminish these other things. And it's unlikely to have direct effects itself. So let me go through these in a little bit more detail. So with modeling, that's. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's indirect okay so the teacher is having emotions in the classroom and the students watch him or her and they learn things probably not from singular instances of modeling but over the length of the school year that probably uh, happens quite a bit so it's this observational learning sort of thing it can be verbal by the things that the teacher says it can be nonverbal. I mean, something as simple as, as smiling. Um, it can be genuine or pretend. This is actually something that's been very challenging for us to work with because teachers frequently upregulate their emotion or at least up, up their display of an emotion. I mean, think about a teacher reading a book where they're like, oh, what's going to happen? You know, <laughs> is that pretend? Well, it's not totally authentic, but I, it, it, these are some of the challenges that we face. Um, it's not necessarily done intentionally. I mean, of course, teachers have emotions in the classroom and they're not thinking, I'm modeling this to children. It's just they have these emotions and children see them. They just, it might be um, intentional sometimes, but a lot of times it's not. So it's what teachers say about how they're feeling. I'm feeling frustrated right now. <laughs> what teachers do with those emotions. So they might know, I think I'm frown. I mean, all of those different sorts of nonverbal things. Their own regulation is sometimes on display. <sighs> you know, just um, all of those things might add up over time to what children learn about emotions. Children might notice patterns where they're seeing what happens before a teacher uh, displays a certain emotion um, or what happens after. And of course, which, uh, which emotions happen. So modeling is all of these things. Now, part of what I want to start to, it's important for how we've created this measure. What we, thought about as we're creating items is essentially what items are are better and worse not the items themselves but they get at better aspects of modeling and worse aspects of modeling like what does really high quality modeling look like what's low quality modeling look like what's in the middle what's a little bit better than that and that's why we've got this ruler thing over there, because it's, it's meant to get you thinking like, okay, well, an item might be getting at this level of quality. It can't really tell you anything about what's, what's below that, but it can tell you what's happening right here. Um, and so a lot of our thinking is built around this idea of, well, what's a little bit better than that? What's a little bit better than that? Um, and, uh, yeah, so in general, we think of high quality things as giving more information to children. And we also somewhat consistent with how we have to analyze it really, is that the higher quality things we somewhat assume are going to be lower frequency. 
Now, we had this presentation that we gave to administrators and teachers, and we got some qualitative feedback from them, and this is uh, what one of them said. I think the other thing teachers can do is they can model for, for children. So, you know, if something is frustrating, you can say, wow, I'm really frustrated. This is not going the way I planned it. I'm not going to get angry. Instead, I'm going to try a different way. Now, I think this person was actually talking about like an internal monologue. But think about if the teacher actually said this out loud. The, the children are getting a lot of information there about how the teacher is labeling their own emotion and how they're processing through it and how they're thinking about how they can not feel that way. So this is the kind of thing that we're thinking about with the model. Now, how this might play out in a classroom. Miss Kim doesn't show any negative emotions in front of her children, even if she's feeling them. Now, I'll tell you, this may or may not surprise you, but uh, Kate Zinzer, my colleague, um, did this uh, paper where she was looking at what we did is we had a group of teachers that were very high in emotional support based on the class measure and a group that was low and then these teachers were interviewed and it, 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 they were group interviewed but we looked to see well, what were the teachers who were very high on emotional support what did they say and what are the group that was low what did they say about emotions and you want to know something really interesting is that the teachers that were low in emotional support, low in observed emotional support, they talk about putting on a happy face when you go in that classroom. You know, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life, you're there for those kids, you need to be there, put on that happy face. And it was the teachers that were observed to be higher in emotional support who talked about, you know, being, well, you're a real person and you can't let that get it too much, but you, it's appropriate to let the kids know that you're having a rough morning or whatever is going on. In a developmentally appropriate way. So, actually, what's better than what Ms. Kim did here would be Ms. Renee looks frustrated and explain why she's experiencing a specific negative emotion. So, I'm feeling frustrated because it's, it's better than just pretending that you don't have that negative emotion. So, I'm going to, for each one of our constructs, I'm going to show you some sample items. Um, that, basically three for every construct, just to give you a sense for where we have wound up with these items. Um, I'll come back to the development a little bit more. But the teacher displays negative emotion non-verbally. Yes or no? Teacher uses polite language to interact with children. No or yes. And you might say, Tim, there's kind of something here, you know, yes, no, no, yes, can't you be consistent? <laughs> And we are being consistent, but it's maybe in a way that uh, you don't realize. So for us, the, the thing that's better is always lower. So it's better if the teacher displays negative emotions on verbally. No, that's what's better for kids, I think. Teacher uses polite language, what's better there? Yes. So for us, we're always kind of working down the line of items to, or response choices to see where the response falls. Teacher vocally expresses labels and explains their own negative emotions. So this is contingent on them having displayed something negative. So it might just be they displayed it and that was it, or what's better than that, if they label it. They at least give it a name. I'm feeling angry. <laughs> that, that's so these are some sample modeling items. Not all of them are dichotomous like this, um, but a lot of them wound up being that, which I can circle back to later on. Are there any questions on modeling? I'm happy to have you interrupt. Yes? On that first item on the left, yes. weren't you saying that it was better to be displaying the negative emotions, or is it just if it's only nonverbal and they don't talk about it? So th this, it, it, and this is where across multiple items we're going to be able to better get at that idea. It's in general probably not great that kids are exposed to a lot of negativity in the classroom, and that's where that idea is coming from. But if negativity is going to happen, it's better that it's labeled. And so, I mean, it, it's it's tough to pull all of these apart. 
we don't want much negativity in the classroom, especially from the teacher. But of course it's gonna happen, and when it happens, let's have a teacher put a label. That's, but it, it's, it's not a singular item that gets us all the way there. Yes? Um, why did you choose to do yes or no as the solid answer rather than like a scale like the class? So that if a teacher only does it sometimes, how do you answer that question? Um, so, there, there's, that's such a big question. I work for, um, I work for Teach Stone. Yeah. So, uh, the, the short answer, at least to your second question about, well, what if, what if you see it, but it's not like, consistent? We are always coding what we call like the capacity. So if you see it once, to, uh, unless it's an explicitly frequency item, where we say like once or twice, zero, once or twice, three or more, unless it's one of those, if you see it at all, you've seen it. If it happens with one kid, it demonstrates the capacity for that teacher to do it with multiple kids. Like that, that's, that's the thinking. Now the Likert question is, is much harder to answer succinctly. Um, but the general idea is that we aren't bound to any certain number of response choices. Um, if two is the, the number that actually demarcates the different responses that we see, then we'll get two. If we need five, we'll have five. And so we're not wed to any particular scale. Each item is its own thing. Um, and that's probably the best short answer that I can give you. Um, but I will say that many of these items did start out with more response choices. I mean, consistent with what I was saying before about, well, what's a little bit better than that? What's a little bit better than that? So, I mean, we did that as we were developing the instrument, but now in many instances, we've collapsed back down. And that can happen for a variety of reasons. Two big ones are raters can't agree. We need people to agree on what they're seeing. And if they can't make those fine gradations, it doesn't do us any good to have those gradations. The other big thing there is, um, do you see it frequently enough to have it be its own thing? So a rule of thumb that we used, which is not super precise or anything, but what our, our statistician told us, is that you kind of need it to happen 10% of the time in order to really do all the psychometric analyses that we kind of need to do. And so if something was happening 4% of the time, it's happening. We thought it would happen and we see it happening, but we might have drop the response option in that, in that instance or combine it with other ones to have fewer choices. So that also happened. Um, but these are difficult decisions. Um, hopefully that gives <laughs> sense for the answer to your question. Are there other questions? Okay, let's keep going. So we're gonna go on to instructing here. Instructing is essentially direct teaching about emotions. It's when the teacher is talking to children about emotions. Now it can happen during explicit lessons. Many schools have social emotional curricula that they use and there might be a certain time where they're talking about emotions. Um, but it doesn't have to be done in a curriculum. It doesn't even have to be planned. So as a matter of fact, we expected a lot of the emotion teaching to just come up. So for example, if a teacher says, oh, when I'm feeling frustrated, I go read a book. That's providing children information about essentially how to regulate so those sorts of things we expected to come up in the classroom. So it can be planned or unplanned. So here are several things that I was thinking about. Ways that we might see instruction. So children are often taught songs about emotions. If you're familiar with Daniel Tiger, he's got a lot of little songs about emotions. 
um, about how to calm down and things like that. So the teacher might teach children uh, uh, songs about emotions. They might play emotion games. This one I think is actually really interesting. So dramatic play in early childhood is pretty ubiquitous. I think some sort of place where they're going to have a kitchen or costumes that they can put on. Like but what we find is that in terms of children learning about emotions, dramatic play is fine, but they really learn about emotions if you give them an emotional role to play. So it's not just you're the baker and you're the customer, but you're the angry baker and you're the happy customer. Go. <laughs> right? And those kinds of situations, children actually learn to take on emotional roles, and in taking on those emotional roles, they seem to learn about their emotions themselves. So the planned activities, using a situation to come up, uh, I already mentioned the regulation strategy, um, talking about the future. Oh, the next time you're feeling that way, what could you do? That, that sort of conversation making connections between actions and feelings, so the behavior and the emotion, um, pointing out verbal and nonverbal cues, like imagine doing a book reading and saying, oh, look at their face here. What emotion do you think that they're feeling? It's, I notice that they're that sort of instruction. So how does this play out in a classroom? Every morning, Ms. Suarez regularly asks children to point to an emotions chart to show how they're feeling. They come in and say, oh, I'm happy. Great. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I'm talking about emotional competence here. The teacher's talking about emotions. Sounds pretty good. Probably is. But how can we take that up a notch? Ms. Thomas also has children point to how they're feeling, but she asks children to explain why they're feeling what they're feeling. And sometimes they ask what they could do to feel differently. So again, it's taking that idea and saying, well, what's a little bit better than that? So these are some items that we have. I, I know it's a lot of text on the screen. I don't want to get bogged down in it. But just to give you a sense, these are real items for us. The teacher labels and describes emotions during book reading. We think that book reading is probably a, a key time for children to be taught about emotions in a planned way. So we've got uh, a book reading. The teacher instructs children about regulating a past or present negative emotion. So actually talking about regulating an emotion we think would probably be helpful. The teacher helps understand that emotions are related to prior events. So making that connection. Oh, why might you be feeling that way? Why might they be feeling that way? What happened? And, and talking about some of those things. So that's instructing. Are there any questions on instructing before we move on? There will be time for questions at the end. Yes? This is a really random question, but we see a lot of um, like video-based book readings, and you have it in your item. And I'm wondering, do you just treat it like normal book reading? Like if it's an adult on the screen reading a book, we and do. the children are watching, you, you you treat that as if it's like yes, we do. But these are the things details, that details. That, details. that come up where you're like. <laughs> it's kind of like the pretend where you're like, oh, I'm not sure. But we do try to step back when we're making these sorts of decisions and say, well, will children learn anything about emotions from this or not? And in that way, functionally, we think it basically operates the same, and so we treat it the same, recognizing that it may not actually be the same, but yeah. Yes? And thinking about kind of that same item, where that's the, like the highest level you've got there is expanding on the emotional contents of the book by labeling or describing. I'm thinking about like when ch teachers go further and ask children, well, how do you think this character is feeling? Why do you think that? What do you see? In, like, is that, is that a separate category or? It used to be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, book reading. I, in particular, I think we used to have like six different yeah. levels in there, and we just didn't see it that much. Unfortunately. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, with the modeling that it could be it could be authentic or it could be kind of you know upregulating to show the emotions. How do you think of uh, when teachers incorporate that modeling into the instruction? That is a more complicated question than you might <laughs> realize. So um, 
we treat <laughs> we treat these different areas in our analysis as separate. We expect that, um, for example, situational instruction might happen after some child emotes, and so we're also going to see responding. So we do expect these things to co-occur. And that's how we capture it. Right. it essentially, it, it, the same event might have coding happen in different areas. Although, for now anyway, we are analyzing them as separate facets. But that is a challenging thing. Yes? I'm wondering, um, so sometimes like when people use the charts in classrooms, like children will misindicate potentially like their emotions. So how do you capture like correction? Um, so the correction would be instructing, okay. um, <laughs> where the, the teacher's providing information about the emotions. Hopefully that correcting is done in a right. sensitive way. Um, <laughs> it's wrong. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that would, in some ways, this is exactly what we're trying to capture. Teachers do those things where they're taking an opportunity that comes up in the classroom, specifically with regard to emotions, and giving children some information about it. So from our perspective, that would be an opportunity to instruct, and we want to see what the teacher does with it. And give them credit for doing that. Yes? Yeah, I have a question. What about like, the context where you're observing this like 10 minute cycle? Because if you happen to be observing during the storybook reading or like in the morning when they are using the feeding chart. So I don't know, I just wonder like how many kind of segments will you need to capture to get like a good representation of this? So that's a great question. And it's one that we will likely have an answer to. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're doing a generalizability theory sort of analysis on this, and we're going to be able to look at where the variance goes mm -hmm. and how much variance is attributable to different parts of the day. Um, we are coding, of course, the activity setting, um, and we'll have a sense for that. But um, for now, we're just capturing as much as we can up until lunchtime, as much of the morning as we can. And we'll, we'll get there eventually. Yeah, good question. To some extent, it also has to do with who are you trying to generalize to and how much of the day. And, and right now, we're not even exactly sure, but we're just trying to generalize to as much as possible, so we're trying to code as much as possible. Great. OK, responded. So children show emotions in the classroom. This comes as a surprise to no one, right? Uh, children get upset about things. And this is where the social aspect of classrooms certainly does come into play. Children are sad when they get dropped off, maybe. Um, excited about something that's going to be happening, or they're going to get a chance to go outside, or that's snowing. I mean, any of the other things. And when children emote, teachers have the opportunity to then respond. So those responses, children are generally going to be encouraged in their emotional displays or discouraged. They can also get information about those emotions that they just displayed. Um, generally speaking, there are you can get more nuanced than this. But generally speaking, teachers' responses fall into two categories. There are validating responses and invalidating responses. Validating responses tell the child, your emotion's OK to feel. And invalidating responses tell the child, your emotion's not OK. Yes? Well, with the validating and invalidating categories in mind, how does that how does that interact with the framing of, of the labels of positive and negative emotions? Yeah, this is this is a challenge also for us. So, um, negative emotions 
when we use that shorthand for negative emotions, we're talking about the valence of the emotion. We're not saying that all displays of negative emotion are inappropriate. Now, you may very well not want to encourage more negative emotion to be displayed. But there's a way to do that with a validating reaction. And that's what we're trying to get at, where you can say, I, I see that you're feeling really angry. As a matter of fact, I think, it, oh, is there another one more? So you can validate emotions without validating a behavior. So you can say, you know, um, yeah, I see that you're really angry, but you can't just knock over that chair. And so that's where we, we do try to walk through this, but it's, it's challenging to capture all that as well. Um, so these are some sample sorts of validating and invalidating things that you might see or hear in the classroom. This is exciting. Why are you angry? Are you okay? Let's go look for that toy. I mean, I, I like that one because it's, it's acknowledging the emotion but also giving a problem focused solution to it. And then there are, like I was saying, there are different kinds of validating and different kinds of invalidating. Here we're getting a smattering of them. Invalidating, you're just, you're just pretending, oh, stop crying. It's not that bad. I don't understand why you're so upset. You're stressing me out. You know what? You know what? Just go over there. After you've come, calm down, then you come talk to me, okay? Right? I mean, these are things, I, I'm a parent too, so I totally get it. <laughs> um, so, so, I, I mean, it, of course, all of this should come with a caveat. But teachers are people. I mean, that's where our research is grounded, right? These the teachers are emotional beings, and of course, they're not always going to be having like the optimal response. Just like a parent, I don't know who's having an optimal response. But these are the kinds of things where, on the whole, we would like to see more validating reactions than invalidating reactions because they tell the kid that your emotion is okay. If you make this a separate issue. But you're, you're, you can feel however you feel. These are some uh, sample responding items. So when the teacher be perceives a behavior problem, how does she respond? She or he respond. Uh, the teacher addresses the behavior without addressing the emotion, or do they get at the emotion that might underlie that behavior? How does a teacher try to help a child feel better? When a negative emotion is presented by any child, how does the teacher respond? So you can see this is very consistent with this idea. They're giving information back to the children about the emotions. I'm gonna keep rolling here and come back to questions a little bit more because I wanna make sure we get some stuff. Sorry. Relating is uh, our last category. Remember, we think that relating is going to amplify or diminish the effect of the other ones. So it's, it's relationships in action. If two people have a relationship, what would you expect to see? So teachers seeking out kids, that sounds like a relationship. Individualized attention, yes. Children seeking out teachers, those are different things, of course. Here's a classroom base example. Teacher asked Sarah, are you ready to have a great day? That sounds like a good way to start the day. Oh, somebody asked me that when I worked in my house. <laughs> Pretty good, but what's better? Something like, is your sister feeling better yet? Right? It gets, it, this tells us that the teacher knows the, more about the child. It's not that this is bad, but if you see that, ooh, that's, that's even better. And these are some relating items. The teacher engages children in conversation that shares personal information. So the teacher, I mean, silly things. I like pizza, you know, like that would count as sharing something personal. The teacher seeks out a disengaged, disinterested, or isolated child. When children arrive or leave for, from the classroom for the day, most are shown affection by the teacher. So these displays of affection, that's also nice to see the evidence of the relationship. Now, 
So that, that's, those are the constructs. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit more about what the measure is telling us and psychometrically where we have, what we're finding with it um, about the instrument itself. So first a little bit about what it's telling us about in the classroom. So bear in mind, we're thinking about the scale view and that's important because we're gonna be taking this uh, item response theory, IRT, specifically rational modeling, um, approach to our analysis. Now, this year, we are using a system um, called Swivel, and it is a little robot that's about this big, and you put an iPad, and we try to have that be in the middle of the room as possible. And the teacher wears a microphone, it's on a lanyard, and that robot turns to follow the teacher. So we always have the teacher, always. We, we usually have the teacher in the frame of the video, and we also have good sound coming from that teacher. That in and of itself is great. Uh, but then we try to improve on that, because, I mean, that shows a, a later classroom. In early childhood, you've got all of these different areas, like you might have a reading corner, for example. And so what we do is we have a satellite camera that's stationary, that sits there, just focused on that area. And when these devices have Wi-Fi, they are able to all communicate and get uploaded together into a common video stream that looks something like this, where you've got the main video right here, and then you've got these other cameras, and then uh, from that you can also toggle the different audio inputs and things like that. It's very cool, when it's all working, it's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mentioned year three. We've got 426 10 minute segments that we coded from this fall. 33 of those segments we had coded by all 18 of our coders. And the other 393 were all coded by a pair. So that's a lot of coding. Um, and part of why we have to do this is that we're trying to understand um, well, radar effects in this case. Our radar is having a big influence on the ratings that we're getting out of this instrument. And so in order to estimate radar effects, you have to have radars code a lot of the same things. <coughs> so from our fall sample, these are just a few tidbits. Teachers modeling of happiness, joy, or excitement occurred in 85% of segments. So quite common, by the way. Because I was just doing these analyses on Wednesday, it's possible I did something wrong. I, kind of like a caveat, you know, a little star. You can't hold me to these for all time, but I think these are solid. Um, modeling of frustration, anger, jealousy occurred in 20% of seconds. So that's still relatively common, much less, but relatively common. Teachers express positive emotions to children Vocally, 67% of the time. Non-verbally, 78% of the time. Bear in mind that uh, a positive emotion, like a, a smile, counts as a non-verbal sort of display of positive emotion. Um, they're also displaying a lot of emotions to their fellow teachers. All of these classrooms have multiple teachers in the room. Expressions of negativity to children happened in 19% of segments vocally and 30 so we're seeing quite a bit of modeling, more on the positive side of things, but quite a bit on the negative side as well. Instructing. 10% of segments had an unplanned instance of instruction, but only 3% had a planned activity. So they're reading a book, and they point out the emotions within the compounds. Um, so this isn't happening uh, very much based on our sample. If we look in unplanned instruction, which really is the vast majority of it, 
We saw teachers talking about sympathy and empathy in 27% of segments. You can kind of imagine that a situation comes up and the teacher talks about essentially having empathy for another child. Sadness or disappointment, 23%. Pride, 17%. But I, I can also see that, like a teacher saying something like, "Oh, you're, you're really proud that you did that, aren't you?" <laughs> like where the kids really excited about it. That sort of thing would, would come as instructor. Um, anger, frustration, that was down like 12, 13%. So it's in there, just not top three. Book reading was observed in 14% of video segments. When there was a book reading, 65% had teachers expand on the emotional content. So um, what this tells us is that book reading does seem to be a good avenue for teaching about emotions, and teachers do seem to take advantage of those opportunities when, when they do a book reading. And responding. Children, when children display negative emotions, teachers' most common response was to ignore it. I don't think that that's a big shocker, but um, you know, they, essentially, it does something. It's not quite invalidating, and so we do have ignoring as its own category. Um, if they don't ignore it, they're much more likely to validate than to invalidate. Is, is good, I think. 6% of segments had teachers respond to children's positive emotions with invalidating. Which, I mean, it's like when those kids are like too excited about something, maybe. And when behavior problems were observed, which was 45% of the segments, we detected some sort of something, um, teachers almost never addressed an emotion that might be related to the behavior problem. It was always sit down. <laughs> like that sort of approach as opposed to saying, whoa, you are really excited now. I and, and trying to somehow parse. You're very frustrated, but we can't. We just didn't really see that. And relating, teachers are working with kids 90% of the cycles. Teachers shared personal information, 18%. So we see these little flips quite a bit. Isolated children are evident in 16% of the segments, but they're only reached out to 13% of the time. So kind of lower than I would know. And children approach teachers for comfort or affirmation in 42% of segments. So a lot of this is consistent with what we expected to see, but there, I think there are a few surprises so that's from our fall data collection. What I'd like to do now, though, is to tell you from our pilot analyses last year. So the, the version of the instrument is, is like one back. Um, we did refine it some based on these analyses that I'm going to present you. But I want to give you a sense for what the kinds of analyses, the kind of information that we get. In general, we're looking for information on how raters perform, how items perform, and how cycles compare to one another. So this is the sample output from raters. And what that shows you, each line is a rater. And the dot shows you like where that, well, each dot is a rater. It shows you where they fall on the difficulty continuum. So you can see that this rater, zero, is essentially like the average. Um, and so this rater rates a little bit less harshly. That rater rates a little bit more harshly. But you can also see that people are pretty stacked up on the middle there. Of course there are going to be some rater differences. But this, for us, was relatively encouraging across our cycles. We aren't seeing these big rater effects. This is for modeling. Let me show you the other domains. So modeling is now top left. You can see, at least if you squint hard enough, but like you can <laughs> see that we we do have people clustered around that midline, but also that there are some differences across domains. 
so you, I mean, you can see that this is a bigger deviation than what we were getting in modeling, for example. And for us, that's important information because it tells us either we need to make the items more specific to like, reduce the rater interpretation, or we need to do a better job training raters. I mean, all of those things are possible. Um, so this is the kind of information that we get about raters. We can also do some simple percent agreement sorts of things. Um, in this version of the instrument, we had all of our items, 70% exact agreement. Uh, all but four had 80% of them. So most of them are 80% exact agreement. So we do a pretty good job with uh, raider agreement. This is a different way of looking at it now we also get information within a single item across all the samples. Now this is a stylized version of the kind of output that we're getting. And this, in this case, what you would have is a single item that has one, two, three, four, five, six different options. And what you want to see when you do this kind of analysis is that the options occur in order, one, two, three, four, five, six, like, so they occur in that, in that way, and that each item has its own peak that is distinct from all the others. That's what we're looking for. This is what we get. Now the first two in there don't look very exciting, and that's because dichotomous items, you don't get much information by looking at them in this way. Um, so, I, there's really not much to say about those first two items. But look at this third one. And this, I, I put this one in there intentionally because this is the challenge that we face. Is that peaking? Does it have its own peak? It's awfully close. Do you change that item? Is it just because you're in that, that one center and that when you get a bigger sample, it will get its own peak. These are very challenging situations that we encountered as we went item by item through our instrument. But you can see that this is very helpful information to get. Um, and for some items we did not have, for example, its own peak and we would say, okay, well, I guess we need to consider combining these. I believe this item we, we basically went by to see how it would perform in our bigger analysis this year. We also get information across items, and this is the one that's probably the single most helpful one, because what you do is each one of these is a, an item, and they're arranged in difficulty. So in other words, this item is the very easiest item, this is the next easiest item, and this item is the hardest item. What this does is it says that this item, let's see this one, you see it's at negative two. What that's saying is that this item can tell you who is two standard deviations below on modeling versus everybody else. So it's just taking one slice. It says this item can do one slice through your sample and it's two standard deviations and below and everybody else. So what we want are items that span this entire difficulty hierarchy. <clears throat> some items cut very low, some items cut high, and in that way when we apply it to our sample, we're able to essentially understand every video segment and where it falls based on these items. Um, so here's a given item. I, I'm referring back to the same items. So this item, 5B, that's one that we saw earlier. The teacher displays negative emotion non-verbally. That's pretty easy to do well it would be a lot better way This gives you a sense for the frequencies. These are a little off given how I had to compute. Um, the teacher displays negative motion non-verbally. Uh, yes, 6.4. 
So that's why it's kind of easy. Only 6.4 of the sample said yes. Um, and then this is an average item. Teacher uses polite language. We see that in 65% of video segments. And then a difficult item. Teacher vocally expresses, labels, and explains their own negative emotions. It makes sense that that one's difficult, right? And so uh, we really only see teacher using those emotion labels in 2.8%. So that gives you a sense for what, what we're working on here. So we, we would do that for every domain and try to understand where our items are falling. This is from like version one of the emotors. This is the item map for instructing. And we looked at that and we're like, huh, okay, because what you'll notice is that Essentially, all of our items except for one are at the midpoint or above. And so we're like, okay, we gotta, we have to generate some more items here. We've got to have more easy items. We need more items because these are overlapping too much. And so this really forced us back to iterative development mode where we're trying to evaluate what our items could do differently, what new items we need. Using this to rate our segments, this is what it looked like. So now each line is a video segment. And what you'll see is, okay, this is like a really high quality segment in terms of instructing. Okay, it goes down, down, down. And then we can't differentiate them at all using those items. So this is just another way of saying like, we needed items they could do a better job differentiating between video segments, particularly at the average and low end. So we wrote a lot of new items, we tried them. This is our new item map. And you can see that we do have more items. We still had a lot of trouble finding items that would capture things at the low end. However, even with um, some improvement, but not as much as we wanted, when we look at the video segments, that's now what it looks like. So we're able to make much better distinctions between video segments based on this newer version of the instrument um, through several iterations. You can see that we still get kind of low resolution view of what's happening on the low end. But this also changed our thinking. It made us realize that instructing itself about emotions is probably a higher order construct. Like, in other words, if you're doing any instructing, you're already kind of out of the, the bottom end of it. We were able to confirm that somewhat with a, a similar analysis, but we put all of the items together instead of treating them each modeling and instructing separately, we put them all together. And what we found is that the modeling items tended to be toward the top. And then, you know, modeling and the others could happen anywhere, but the instructing ones were toward the top. So it helped our thinking about the construct itself by looking at these sorts of things. But I wanted to give you a flavor for the actual process that we're engaged in. Um, and how it's iterative and how challenging it, it really is. And just for comparison, here's modeling, <coughs> same cycle map. So that it shows you how our different cycles compare um, in, in terms of their model. Th those are our error bars around it, by the way, so you can see that, I mean, that, that higher the resolution, the smaller those are. And so, I mean, we can't make super fine grain distinctions, but we are able to differentiate you know, this one somewhat from the other. So. There have been some challenges along the way. I've alluded to them, talked about them a little bit. But fundamentally, 
our fundamental task is very challenging, which is generating items with sufficient variability that raters can agree on, that capture our cost structure of interest. That's hard. And we keep on having to do it, and it's still hard. <laughs> um, the simple RA time demands. I mean, so, you know, I get lots of emails asking if I want help in my lab, and I say, yes. All you need is to be free one day a week from like 7 a.m. till 1. And a lot fewer people are able to do that. <laughs> so um, it, it's, I, I'm very thankful for my team. They're, they're really awesome. Um, but it is hard to have people uh, that have this kind of time to go into the centers because they got to set up all the video equipment and then come back and upload it. It's, it's a big ask. And then there are some technological challenges that we've encountered at every step of this project. Um, so I, I mentioned, for example, that those devices need Wi-Fi in order to talk to each other, and uh, we thought that hotspots would be the answer, but if you're in the basement of a place, that may not be the answer, and other things of that nature have been a challenge throughout the project. Um, and we've learned and we've gotten better at it, but. I mentioned to Sarah last night. We piloted our process, of course. We didn't realize it at the time, but we had piloted it under ideal conditions. <laughs> so um, we should have done some more extensive piloting, but we, we kind of thought that we were in better shape than we were. Um, nonetheless, we're getting through them. It's, it, it's been a little bit of a struggle. Um, looking forward. What we're going to do this winter data collection, um, literally today, I have people in the centers handing out these books. Um, we have a wordless storybook. Mercer Mayer uh, did like the Critter series. This is another series, the, the Frog books. And these are wordless storybooks. So they have emotional content in them, but no words. There's a story, but no words. And so this is our chance to have one thing be the same across all of our classrooms. And so both participating teachers in a classroom have their own book that we're going to capture and code. We're excited to see the results of that. We expect to see variability based on what teachers are doing with these books. And, and to some extent, we're going to be able to have a direct comparison because everybody's doing the same. So we're very Yes. You said there's a story, but there's no words. Yes. Um, Things happen right. that are coherent in, a, in an arc of a story. Right. But there aren't words there to tell the teacher how to tell the story. So some teacher may, for example, focus on what this child is feeling, mm -hmm. and others may not say anything at all. Oh, there goes the frog jumping. You know, it, like it, there are different ways of telling the story, and we just want to see with our instrument <laughs> what we can detect. And so is the, it is the focus on just whether or not a f the feeling comes forward, or is there also an attempt to capture the feeling that's assigned to the image? We have not like master coded the book or anything like that. Okay. It, it's, it's more rudimentary than that. We're just gonna code these segments using our instrument. And, and that's really about it. Good question. I, that would be a whole different approach and there would be merit in that as well but we're not going there. Yes? So how much have you talked with the teachers whose classrooms you're going in about what you are doing? As like, little as possible. OK. <laughs> okay. Uh, but it's, it's challenging. I mean, uh, we, we, I mean, we tell them that we're trying to validate this instrument. We're trying to understand what they do with children around emotions in the classroom. 
and things like that. But we try not to say, we're looking at how you model, we're looking at how you like, okay. we, so we, we keep it broad and it seems sufficient. But that is a challenge, of course, is to get them invested while also not spilling beans. So this is an activity that we're doing in the next few weeks. Um, we're also going to, in the spring data collection, give them a short lesson on emotions. Here, it's kind of different. Everybody's doing the same ex activity, but we don't expect much variability. So with the wordless storybook, we expect variability. With the lesson on emotions, we, all we want to see is movement in the emotors. But we expect that movement to be relatively uniform. We'll see. Um, and then we've got outcome data, outcome, it's throughout the whole year, but we've got teacher self-reports, we've got teacher child reports, and then we, next summer, we'll be doing coding with the in-class on some of the participating children. So that's a whole other thing. Okay. Way down the road, we would love to Assuming we can get our instrument to work. <laughs> Assuming our instrument relates to children's development in the way that we expect. If those boxes are checked, then, I mean, we really designed this with professional development in mind. And this goes back to what I was saying before about, well, what's the next best thing? Imagine professional development where you know how a teacher typically scores, <laughs> and then you go, okay, well, what's the next thing that they could do in terms of modeling? What's the next thing that they could do in terms of instructing? And what I like about that approach is that it, it's all within arm's reach. They've already demonstrated competency here. We know from looking across teachers that if they can do this, the next thing that they could probably do is this. And so this targeted professional development we believe would be effective. That's something, really, of course, and you know, these highfalutin hopes of uh, helping to shape culture and climate around emotion and around the technical education. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but those, of course, are going to take a lot more building, not just of the instrument itself, but the entire evidence space. Now with that, of course, I want to acknowledge the U.S. Department of Education, which is uh, paying for this uh, measurement development. Um, we've got a bunch of teachers and centers and families involved. Couldn't do it without them. And then we both have teams that are supporting all of this um, that are critical, of course, to this work success. Um, with that, I thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. It's something that I have struggled with as well. First of all, this was super interesting so for sharing it. I just wonder, given like the paper that you shared with us about like how most of this research comes from a more like quite affluent samples, then I struggle a bit with defining like what is like a little bit better like for whom are we defining that? So I just wonder how have you like discussed that or like conversation? How do you like kind of Deal yeah. with that generally like so I, I would say our approach is at least two things. Um, one, we've had an expert panel, and the expert panel includes some people with expertise on culturally appropriate teaching and, and explicitly asking them how, how would this work in a variety of different settings. So that's, that's one way that we've tried to account for that. Another aspect of that is that this year we explicitly went out to try to get a variety of different centers. And so we have centers that are relatively affluent, but we also have some that are definitely not. Um, and so we're trying to see this year, does it still work the same? Does it still work so to some extent, we're treating it as an empirical question. Um, and it's possible that we'll have to either modify the instrument or um, at least put some caveats on it. 
Um, our approach, we believe, should yield something that isn't super sensitive to some of those things in a good way. It's not picking up on, on that. And by the next best thing, we're, we're approaching that from the vantage point of like effective. What's the next best thing in terms of its effectiveness for teaching kids about emotions? Um, but a lot of these we're treating as empirical questions. We don't actually know how these constructs relate to uh, our children's outcomes. That remains to be seen. Um, and it's possible that we'll have to revise some of our ideas based on that. Um, based on other findings that are a bit more sparse in the, in the education literature and, and more robust in the uh, sorry, parenting literature, we do expect these things to relate to us. But a lot of that is to be determined. Good question. Yes? Um, I actually have a follow-up question. So you had said that you guys were sort of making the assumption that teachers displaying to one child display the capacity to display to all children. But we know from the literature that teachers differentially interact with students based on race and gender and a whole bunch of things. And uh, like, so conceptually, I understand where you're going with that, but um, I'm having trouble, especially with the gender piece, because we know, like, patriarchal society and misogyny, like, in so much of emotion and teaching of emotion and expectation for emotion is wrapped up in that. And so are, down the road, are you guys expecting to find gender differences? Because I think, like, if a teacher displays the emotion and it's really intended for a group of young girls in the class, is that really being extended to the young boys in the class? I, I, that's a very challenging thing to um, respond to in some ways, because on the one hand, I, I absolutely what you're saying could be happening. And on the other side of the planet, whatever, um, we're we're trying to just understand what's happening in classrooms already, um, and part of how we would initially detect what we were talking about is: do we see differences in the development of these things, like in an interaction sort of way with the kids? And that will be our first look into that. Um, it's not so far baked into how we have developed the instrument. Um, and that's because we're trying to have an instrument that would work, more or less, just by watching the teacher. And, and it's a teacher classroom based thing. And these questions that pull it down into the child level are totally appropriate, but it's hard yeah. um, for us to understand that when we don't even necessarily understand it at the classroom level. From our perspective, I think we're approaching it like, let's understand the classroom first and then go deeper. There's another equally valid way of building up, but we're taking this top-down perspective. Which, it has its limitations for sure. Yes? Oh, one more question? I don't know if I need the last question. I was going to follow up to that. Are you? Sharing, like, when you have information about the individual children in the way that you could potentially track, like, is it just that a teacher is only interacting with the same three children? I, is there a way that you could so, just, like, fold that? So, um, response rates for child participation vary relatively dramatically across classrooms, and in some classrooms we have near universal enrollment of kids, and in other classrooms we have four or five. Does that vary by? Types of centers and where they are. So it's confounded a lot. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to be a little limited on this. Now, with a measurement development grant, we're not trying to like do extensive validation. We're just trying to get a first look. Like, do these things relate? We do want to further validate the instrument to some extent, develop it, where we would have a better understanding of, of some of those very things. Um, so we do have data on some kids, sometimes most of the kids, and we'll be able to get at least some sense for how the, these constructs are playing out predicting things for the children. But even in the video, could you just track, or are you not allowed to even 
Like you'd have video footage, I guess, is what I'm asking. Right. And we are going to be coding participating children. Okay. okay. Uh, in terms of their, their videos. Okay. For now, that's going to be limited to the end. Well, please join me in thanking our former yeah. Thank you very much.